That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. So today's Daily Dose of Stupid is going to be a week in review of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because she says so many stupid things that she can fill up an entire week of Daily Dose of Stupid just by herself. So what we're going to do is we're going to compress that because we've been doing different Daily Doses of Stupid all week. We're going to compress that into one giant AOC Daily Dose of Stupid extravaganza. So the first thing that I wanted to bring up that I thought was quite humorous is she suggested that conservatives earlier this week when she was talking, she suggested that conservatives were trying very hard to shut her up, which is hilarious on a number of levels. First of all, I think it kind of plays into this fantasy. She believes herself to be a very dynamic person that scares Republicans. And because Republicans talk a lot about her, that she is somebody that's kind of a thorn in their side. And because she's constantly saying things that are witty and intelligent and true, she genuinely believes that Republicans are scared of her. Now, to put that in proper context, you need to remember that UAOC, though it was an accomplishment, and I'm not trying to diminish anything from it, You unseated a very unpopular, somewhat moderate Democrat in one of the bluest regions, one of the bluest voting districts in the country. I mean, it's not like you took down one of the biggest heavy hitters in there. For example, it's not like you brought down Ted Cruz. If Bob O'Rourke had brought down Ted Cruz, that would be a heck of an accomplishment a very prominent, important Republican in a red state. You did not. You removed a Democrat, most of whom no one had ever heard of, not somebody that was super popular or somebody that was a big deal. You wound up beating him in a primary and going on and winning in one of the bluest districts in the country. And after you won the primary, which admittedly was a feat, there was virtually no chance whatsoever that you were going to lose the next election, and so really you've had one election that you won. It's a win, but it's not super impressive. And you've never been somebody that's in any point been a threat to an actual Republican in a competitive district. So the idea that you terrify Republicans, not really something that you should be convincing yourself of until you've actually gone up against one in a real battleground. But that's what she's, that's apparently what she believes in herself. She's, she thinks that she's very scary to Republicans, but I guess only in her fantasy world. Here's the thing. There are people that actually do want to shut, shut Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez up. There are, there are people that want to silence AOC. And those people are Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and virtually everybody that's a member of the old guard on the left. There has been a tiff between her and Joe Biden because Joe Biden kind of helps represent that old guard Democrat establishment. And they hate AOC and AOC hates them. And they are constantly at one another's throats. But the reason that you've got Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and AOC spouting their mouth off every 10 seconds and the old guard of the Republican or sorry, the Democrat party that really don't like them and wanting to shut them up. The reason for that is they know that they make them look bad. People like Tlaib and Omar and AOC. They make the Democrats less palatable to the middle of the country. If anything, I think AOC has been a giant gift that helped keep the House from going even further to the left and allowed us to actually make gains in the Senate during the midterm. I mean, it was an incredibly underwhelming election for what should have been a pretty massive blue wave that turned out to be a blue trickle that barely got anybody wet. And so because of that, I think that AOC actually played a pretty big role because the average American is looking at people like AOC that's literally suggesting we tear down every building and start from scratch and get rid of all the cars and switch to trains and kill all of the cows because when the cows, uh, when the cows poop, methane makes the world hotter. I mean, this is a person that is completely off her rocker 
And the average person looks at that and like, I don't want any part of that. And the old guard Democrats, they understand that. Now, a lot of the old guard Democrats actually do have the same goal as AOC, but they believe in moving there slower. That's what progressive means. The difference in a socialist and a progressive is that a progressive wants socialism, they just want to get there at a slower pace because they think it'll be easier. A progressive is a socialist without the revolution. That's the difference. And because of that, the progressives in the party, like Hillary Clinton, like Nancy Pelosi, not like Joe Biden, like Chuck Schumer, like a lot of the other representatives in the House, the reason that they don't like AOC is they're taking the mask off. They're saying, no, we're socialists, we want socialism, we want to have a, be a completely socialist country in about 10 years. And the progressives are looking at that as like, if you just shut up, we'll get there, it'll just take a little longer. But if you keep shouting from the rooftops your ideology, the American people are going to catch on, and then they're going to vote for the other guys, and that's going to slow the plan down. That's the reason they don't get along. From a conservative standpoint, I don't know a single conservative that actually wants to silence AOC. Every conservative, heck, even every rhino that I know, is constantly telling AOC, yeah, talk as much as you want. In fact, if you gave me a magic button, or if you gave me two magic buttons, and I had the option to pick either one that I wanted to press, and one was AOC can never talk again, and the other one was AOC can never stop talking. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, she will continuously talk. Believe me, I pick button number two. I don't even have to think about it. I smack button uh, number two down before they're even done reading me the options. AOC, talk as much as you want, as often as you want. I am so glad that you're so social media savvy and virtually every second of your life is videotaped because that is a huge, huge win for conservatives that you're as out there as you are, that you're available to the press and that you're talking and getting as much attention as you are. As much attention as we can give to her, please, as many cameras, as many microphones, I want AOC to uh, be constantly in communication with the American people because she is a huge reminder of how absolutely bat crap crazy the Democrat agenda is. And this is not the only dumb thing that she said the week, uh, this week. Let's look at one of her tweets. So this is from earlier this week. AOC saying, Remember, Clinton was also impeached. That failed in the Senate, too. Our institutions didn't suffer then, but they have been damaged greatly today with willingness to impeach. Whether it's dim fear or GOP recklessness doesn't matter. Failure to impeach now is a neglect of due process. <sighs> Somebody has got to get this girl a legal dictionary. I mean, someone has got to get her. A legal dictionary. That's not due process. Now, if you want to make the stance, if you want to make the case, let's just say that Trump was some kind of big evil dictator and that he was undermining the Constitution and he was taking people's rights away. Let's just say that that, that worldview were correct. Let's say that that was reality. Even then, a failure to impeach is not a failure of due process. It would be a dereliction of constitutional duty, but it wouldn't be a neglect of due process. So here's a actual definition of due process. A course of formal proceedings, such as legal proceedings, carried out regularly and in accordance with established rules and principles. Yeah, a failure to impeach is not a neglect of due process. In fact, that would be impossible because impeachment is actually a part of due process. That would be like saying uh, a Reading Miranda rights is a failure of due process. No, Miranda rights are actually part of due process. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of what you're saying. Neglecting du due process, for example, to give you an example of what an actual neglect of due process would look like, would be like if you were wiretapping a presidential candidate just to get information on him and you were using a fake FISA warrant to do so, which was drummed up by a fake steel dossier. That would be an example of a failure of due process. That would be an example of a neglect of due process. Because you're not using the process that is given to you. You are not actually going through the motions the way that you're supposed to in order to get the legal ruling that you want. 
Or, for example, a neglect of due process would be if you broke into somebody's house to find evidence on them. Well, you didn't have a warrant. You have to have a warrant to go into somebody's house to start looking for evidence, and you have to know exactly what you're looking for, and there needs to be a name and a date and all these other things for to qualify for a warrant. And so that's due process. So obtaining evidence illegally, that would be an example of a neglect of due process. What you're talking about is not a neglect of due process. All right, let's look at another tweet from AOC, because this is a good one too. And I especially like this one because, you know, it, it has a Bible angle to it. Usury, aka high interest, happens to be explicitly denounced in the Bible and in many other religions. Looking forward to having the religious right uphold their principles plus sign on to my bill. Unless, of course, they're only invoking religion to punish women plus queer people. Yeah, to understand this one, you do have to know that she and Bernie Sanders proposed a plan earlier this week that what they want to do is they want to get rid of uh, any any kind of interest rate over 15%. So, for example, whether you're talking about bank loans or credit cards, 15% is the cap. You can never charge more than 15% which is a bad idea on a number of levels. But regardless of that, I'm not even going to get into the, the rigor morore, the, the fine details of that particular legislation. wouldn't affect me personally because I'm never going to take out a loan that would charge more than that. <laughs> but nonetheless, that was the case that she made. And the, it was all predicated on this idea that there are several religions that actually denounce this. Well, first of all, if you're the one that's constantly saying, no, 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 we can't use religion as a basis for any of our policy, then you can't bring religion in as a basis for your policy when it suits you. You can't say, well, religion shouldn't play any role in your political decisions. You can't say that and then say, oh, well, in this case, religion actually backs me up, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. Second of all, Let's actually look at the passage that she's talking about in the Bible. So let's go ahead and just read that. There we go. So this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 19 through 20, which reads, You shall not charge interest to your countrymen, interest on money, food, or anything that may be loaned at interest. You may charge interest to a foreigner, but your countrymen you shall not charge interest so that the Lord, your God, may bless you in all that you undertake in the land which you are about to enter to possess. Yeah, so once you actually look at what was being said about this commandment in the book of Deuteronomy, part of the Law of Moses, you understand that this was specifically a command that was given to Israel, and it only applied to other Jews. So Jews weren't allowed to charge interest to other Jews. They were specifically allowed to charge it to anybody else. And so the Bible is not making a moral statement for Christians at all. It's not even talking about them. And specifically what it's doing here is it is not saying that it is immoral to charge interest. It's saying that this was a policy that was to be used within the realm of Judea, within the kingdom of Israel, and specifically only to other Jews residing in that kingdom. If there was somebody that was a non-Jew, a foreigner, that was sojourning with them, they were allowed to charge interest. And so the Bible is not saying that interest in and of itself is evil, and it's not even specifically pointing out usury. It's saying that interest should not be charged to your fellow countrymen. And again, let's also bring this up. If, if AOC is trying to use this as a basis for her policy, 15% interest, still interest. So even if it didn't specifically pertain to the Jews, and even if it did make a statement, a moral statement about interest and said that all interest is bad, which again, it does not, even then, your law still allows for 15% interest. <laughs> so it fails basically every test that you could put it to. That There's absolutely no way that you could look at this biblical commandment specifically given to the Jews and in any way extrapolate a 15% cap on interest rates. It just does not make any sense. <laughs> but 
AOC, I guess that uh, facts and reason don't really matter when you're AOC. But one other point that I wanted to bring up too. Nobody is trying to turn America into a theocracy. Because Christianity itself isn't a theocracy to begin with. It never calls for a theocracy. Christianity in and of itself doesn't even call for the making of a nation-state based on the laws of Christianity. Now, the Jews did. They were a nation-state that was run by the law of Moses. That was supposed to be the way that the kingdom of Israel worked. Islam does the same thing. It seeks to establish a caliphate. Christianity doesn't. It specifically states in there that the kingdom of Christ is a kingdom not of this world. It is a spiritual kingdom based on the unity of individuals. Not a nation, not a world power. That's not something that Christianity is interested in. And so I don't know of a single person, I don't understand these people that are saying, she's saying, well, they're only using it to go against women and homosexuals. You're not using religion for that. I don't know of anybody that's using religion for that. There are people that say it's morally wrong because of their religion. But there are not Christians that are saying, well, this thing ought to be made illegal or this thing ought to be made legal because this is what the Bible says. I really don't know any Christians that are even making that case at this point. But nonetheless, that's what she's going on. Now, this may be my favorite thing. Uh, she goes and does this video about a community garden and make some interesting observations about the kinds of vegetables that were being grown there. Take a look. So well, that's really how you do it right. That is such a core component of the Green New Deal is having all of these projects make sense in a cultural context. And it's an area that I and we get the most pushback on um, pe because people say like, why do you need to do that? That's too hard. But when you really think about it, when someone says that it's too hard to do a green space that grows yucca instead of, I don't know, cauliflower or something, um, it, you're, what you're doing is that you're taking a colonial approach to environmentalism. And that is why a lot of communities of color get resistant to certain environmentalist movements because they come with a colonial mm. colonial lens on them. <laughs> so that's AOC. <laughs> oh, you can't make this stuff up. Apparently, certain vegetables are racist. <laughs> so I read the Green New Deal from beginning to end. It's only five pages long. And I guess somehow I missed this. I don't remember community gardens even being a part of it. Maybe it was, but I certainly don't remember her talking about certain vegetables being colonial and racist. <laughs> Apparently, yucca, whatever the heck that is, and keep in mind, I do have a degree in agriculture. <laughs> yucca, whatever that is, that's that's okay. That's that's the woke vegetable. <laughs> And cauliflower is colonial and racist. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why she thought cauliflower was going to be the racist vegetable. Maybe it's because it's the only vegetable that I can think of that's white. And since white is evil, according to AOC, that cauliflower is the colonial vegetable. <laughs> oh, where does she get this stuff? See, this is the reason that nobody wants to shut AOC up. Because it is the most entertaining thing that has happened in politics in years. I think she may be the only politician on earth that's more entertaining than Donald Trump, and she really is. But yeah, I guess because cauliflower is the white fruit, they're the sorry, the white vegetable that that's the one that's strong and colonialist, and that's the reason that people of color are rejecting environmentalism. You're, you're really blaming the fact that your policies suck and that there are people, even in minorities, that don't like your plan. You're saying the reason they can't accept it is because cauliflower is a racist vegetable. Her mind is such a bag of cats. You have no idea where it's going. <laughs> and here's the thing. The fact that most people would grow something like cauliflower or something that's more familiar to their home isn't because of cultural oppression it's because of climate and because of the environment surrounding them. The reason that we don't grow, for example, 
pineapples here in Alabama is not because we hate Hawaiian people or we hate people living in the Pacific. The reason we don't grow them here is because they won't grow here. It's not that people don't like pineapples. We eat a lot of pineapples in Alabama. We don't grow them because they will not grow. We don't grow them because it's impossible. And that's a little bit of an extreme example because a pineapple actually just straight up won't grow here in Alabama because it's not a tropical environment. But when it comes to the reason that people don't grow certain things in their garden, a lot of times it has a lot more to do with what will grow there rather than thinking, I wonder how racist this vegetable is. <laughs> Again, you can't make this crap up. This is just how bat crap insane she is. Which ironically, the bat crap actually helps the plants grow. But nonetheless, uh, when we're looking... We're looking at this. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're colonial or whatever. The reason that people tend to grow crops that are familiar to their culture is because that's what grows there. The reason that they're familiar with it is because that's what grows in that environment. The reason that Alabama grows a lot of cotton is because we got ground that's good for growing cotton. The reason we grow a lot of peanuts in the South is because the soil's good for it. And the environment's good for it. These things were not designed as a, a cultural statement. Unlike what goes on, the, the fantasy world that goes on inside AOC's mind, not everything is a statement of race. Not everything is a statement of culture. Some things are a matter of pragmatism. And in agriculture, that's very, very often the case. This idea, don't ever tell me, again, anybody, this is a non-starter with me from here on. Don't tell me that there aren't people that see racist, racism in absolutely everything. AOC literally just claimed that the things that people are growing in their garden is racist. That there are certain vegetables that are racist and certain vegetables that are not racist. Don't tell me that people aren't seeing racism in absolutely everything after watching that clip. But you know what? That's not even the last dumb thing she has said this week. So here we go on to the last part of our AOC Daily Dose of Stupid special. Uh, this is from her earlier this week. If I can go ahead and get it pulled up. There we go. So this is from, I think, Instagram is where she posted this. Uh, well, that was something. Alarms went off in the building advising people to seek shelter. Apparently the tornado moved slash missed the city so quickly that they ended the warning shortly after. And also, apparently, this is a thing that happens in the summer here, with increasing intensity, by the way, a sentence fragment. The climate crisis is real, y'all. Guess we're at casual tornadoes in growing regions of the country. <laughs> First of all, for Little Miss Woke, I find it incredibly offensive that she is appropriating my culture. She's not allowed to say y'all. I can say y'all. I'm from Alabama. You're from the Bronx. Well, kind of. She spent the first five years of her life in the Bronx and then moved to a very nice neighborhood. <laughs> and you're Puerto Rican. You don't get to co-opt my culture. How dare you, AOC? How dare you appropriate my culture? <laughs> we can play that game too if you want to. It's just so absurd. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can't use y'all. That is clearly a Southern staple. You're not allowed to use it anymore. And if you have a problem with it, well, then don't say anything about me wearing a sombrero on Cinco de Mayo. You, <laughs> you got to have a consistent standard. But nonetheless, that's not even what I really wanted to point out here. Um, apparently, the thunderstorms are all the result of climate change. That's her conclusion is because they had a tornado scare. And I want to remind you, this is a tornado that didn't even touch down. It wasn't... <laughs> The, it, the warning just passed basically as soon as it started. That's how mild this thing was. And this has been going on in DC's in, in DC during the summer, basically forever. And somehow this is climate change. Well, it's not just me that is pushing back on this. Ryan Mao, I believe I'm saying his last name right. Ryan Mao, who is a meteorologist with a PhD, actually responded to this. Uh, with a tweet. So here's his first tweet in response to this. I thought this was fake, but it's from the A AOC Instagram story. No idea what she means with casual tornadoes. Yeah, casual tornadoes are not a thing. 
Um, maybe if the, the tornado was wearing a t-shirt, then I could see it. Maybe, maybe t-shirt or a t-shirt tux- tuxedo, a, a t-shirt tuxedo tornado. That's a casual tornado. And how this line of severe thunderstorms is proof of any, quote, climate crisis. It's just weather in D.C. And this is the point that he's been making, and this is the point that people on the right have been making for a long time. I have no idea what this guy's policies are like. I just happen to know that he's a meteorologist. And this is something that we hear all the time. This is just the weather in D.C. These thunderstorms and severe storms have been going on in D.C. since long before humans even settled here, long before the Industrial Revolution. This has been going on for a long time. They've tried to blame all kinds of weather events. Bernie Sanders, for example, tried to blame a severe tornado that happened that destroyed that big church in Wetumpka, tried to blame that on climate change. I mean, for Pete's sake, we're in Tornado Alley. The idea that tornadoes are a new thing and they're somehow caused by climate change is just absurd. And this guy, for all I know, actually believes in climate change. Maybe even more so than I do. I have no idea. But he's looking at this and he's saying, clearly, this is just this is just weather in D.C. This is something that's been going on forever. This isn't climate change. And he kind of doubles down on that with his second tweet here. So this is another one by the same guy, Ryan Mao. The congresswoman AOC does not know the difference between weather and climate. Let's try an easy analogy. Weather is what outfit you wear out the door. Climate is your closet wardrobe. And I mean, he's exactly right here. If you happen to be wearing a t-shirt on any given day, that does not mean that you have only t-shirts in your closet, nor is it indicative you may only have one t-shirt. That doesn't mean that you even have extra t-shirts in your closet. And so your wardrobe could have changed significantly, or not at all. Whatever you're wearing that day is not an indicator of that necessarily. And so climate is something that you have to look over a long period of time with a lot of data. One weather event does not equal climate change or climate staying the same. And this is one thing that you always heard whenever we would kind of joke about, for example, that time that uh, was Al Gore's flight that got snowed in when he was going to talk about global warming. And that was pretty funny. Or the time that the uh, there was a bad um, ship getting stalled out. I don't know exactly what the technical nautical term for that is, but they got caught up on the ice. They got trapped in the ice when they were going down to Antarctica to study climate change. I mean, yeah, that's pretty funny. It's ironic. But what he's saying here is the same thing that liberals say to conservatives whenever they sort of point to that as as being sort of a a, a funny, ironic thing. They're saying, yeah, well, the thing is that that weather doesn't, it doesn't equal climate. But see, that's what's so funny about it. They'll say that every time that the weather doesn't back up their philosophy of climate change. But whenever there is a weather event that they feel as though they can tie back to climate change, they always try to. A perfect example was Katrina. Remember in the movie An Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore said that Katrina is going to be the norm from now on. We're going to have these Category 5 hurricanes hitting very frequently, practically every year. And then we had a 12-year hiatus and did not have another Category 5 hurricane until Hurricane Harvey. And then as soon as Hurricane Harvey hit, they said, well, it's because of climate change. They always Anything that happens proves their point. If there's a lot of hurricanes, it's because of climate change. If there's no hurricanes, it's because of climate change. If it's hot, it's climate change. If it's cold, it's climate change. If it's moderate, it's climate change. doesn't matter. And this is why the pseudoscience of climate change doesn't make any sense. I mean, is the weather, is the climate as a whole warming? Yeah, it goes through warming periods and cooling periods. That happens. But the idea that man is doing this and these weather events are proof of climate change, it's simply not true. Thunderstorms have been going on for a long time. And if anything, that is a very conclusive example of why I want AOC to continue talking as much as possible, as often as possible, whenever there is a microphone near her. She's got a lot more mouth than she's got brains, so please, by all means, AOC, keep talking. Normally, this is the part of the video where you would expect me to ask you to like the video and subscribe to the channel, but the truth is, I don't really care whether you do or not. In fact, you know what? Don't subscribe. It's not like there's a lot of really important stuff going on in the world in the state of Alabama that you should probably be aware of. 
So yeah, go ahead and subscribe or don't. I don't really care. Reverse psychology. Boom.